I'm speaking with Ian Moore, professor of microbiology at New York University Medical Center. Thanks for joining me today, Ian. Thanks for inviting me. This little chat we're going to have is part of our new virology textbook, and you in particular are, uh, I'm talking with you about the chapter on translation. Yes. So I'd like to talk a little bit about your work in that area, but first I'd like to know a little bit about you, where you were born and educated. I was born in New Hyde Park, New York. Uh, I was an undergraduate at the University of Rochester, uh, upstate. I, I uh, studied English, literature, and biology. It was a double major, sort of as a late bloomer into the field of biology. Um, and uh, I did my thesis research at Cold Spring Harbor. I uh, got my PhD from Stony Brook and did a postdoc at uh, University of California, Berkeley. And then I did a, uh, a small stint in a uh, big pharmaceutical company for four years before getting a faculty job at, at NYU. So what got you interested in a career in science? Uh, it was all kind of an accident, I think. Um, I guess I always, looking back on it, I always did well in science in high school. Uh, but it wasn't something that really ignited my passion. And, and I needed to take a class to fulfill a science requirement as an undergraduate. <laughs> and this whole time that recombinant DNA was sort of just beginning, and, and I, I didn't know anything about that, and it kind of was really exciting to me. So I, I sort of weaseled my way into this genetics class without the prerequisites that you needed to take the class. Uh, and I kind of experienced science in a way that I never experienced it before. It became extremely fascinating and fun. And, and there were things that I learned that were really, uh, I still had a very powerful effect on me. The idea about you know, DNA binding proteins, regulating gene expression. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just really thought that was fascinating. And after I took that class, um, uh, I, I wanted to take some more biology, and, and, and I sort of was approaching science from a very different way. And so that didn't happen until sophomore year. Um, so up until that point, I had been taking exclusively humanities classes. You have some great scientists at Rochester. That's probably what helped you get interested, right? They're, they did great research, and they were good teachers. Yeah, there were some great teachers. It was really great. And, uh, and, and then I started, you know, I became friends with graduate students that were there. Yeah. Um, people that were just, uh, you know, working on their dissertations, and, and, and uh, I sort of got bitten by the bug at that point, and, yeah. th and then started taking classes. Uh, you know, all the requirements I really enjoyed, organic chemistry and, and all of these things. So it really was a, it was a fortuitous moment. It was not like, you know, this plan that was, you know, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to um, work on viruses or something like that. You'd be surprised how few scientists right. have a plan. Right. <laughs> so you're not you're not unique. So you spent a great part of your career working on translation, protein synthesis uh, in cells or in infected cells. How did you get interested in that particular topic? You know, it's 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 a similar answer. Again, it's it's an accident and, and a lot of happenstance that that, that goes into this. Um, I was never really working on that as a student or a, or a postdoc. Um, but I had been exposed to viral models mm -hmm. of as powerful cell biological and, and genetically defined models of biology. Um, and, and the combination of genetics and biochemistry in, in, in a system being, being able to put together some very powerful conclusions in biology mm -hmm. from that. And so th it really started when I was at a, a pharmaceutical company um, working on a number of independent research uh, projects, trying to find something to do. Uh, I was very fortunate to be in a position where um, my boss at the time was running a basic science section of the department, and we were sort of helping the drug screening effort, but we were all encouraged to find things to do, basic science things. And, and uh, there were a number of uh, little crazy things that we were doing that I won't go into that dealt with, didn't deal with protein synthesis, but. But at, at one point, uh, Bernard Roisman's group had published a paper about this really interesting gene in herpes simplex virus um, called the gamma 34.5 gene. And a deletion of this gene completely attenuated the virus for virulence. So it was defined as a very, very important viral gene with a very sound pathogenic phenotype. And one of the phenotypes in culture was 
um, in certain kinds of cultured cells, uh, the early events of the viral life cycle were fine. But then after DNA replication, all protein synthesis would cease. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were a variety of ideas around it as to how that was explained. Um, but I, I then sort of taught myself how to work on HSV because I'd never worked on it before. And I had made my own uh, version of, of this deletion mutant. So I made a complete null. And I then set about trying to get an extragenic suppressor of this virus. Mm -hmm. And so really all that I knew was this was a very important viral gene. And, and from my experience as a student and a postdoc, I had seen that suppressor mutations of very important viral genes tend to be very interesting. There's no guarantee. <laughs> but if you could get it, mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't easy to get, uh, and obviously I had never worked on herpes before, so I was teaching myself everything. Uh, in an environment where there was no one working on, 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 uh, on the virus. Uh, I had one close colleague who was working on, on CMV there, and so we were sort of, sort of guiding me. Um, and that suppressor rescued the protein synthesis defect of the virus. Uh, it didn't restore virulence. It created a very interesting story, which uh, then created a story for me to go on the job market to try and get an academic job, which is something I was always interested in doing. Um, and it introduced me into the protein synthesis world hmm. and, and the idea of translational control. Um, so that experiment then set the stage for everything else in the field of translation. But again, it was not, uh, it was just following through some genetics of a very interesting, important viral gene that someone else defined and, and then doing classical genetic analysis on mm -hmm. it and then mm -hmm. figuring out what was going on. I guess that also answers the question I was going to ask, why herpes viruses? And right. And it go. was also, uh, uh, again, an accident. Uh, yeah. However, you know, they are really important, uh, interesting viruses. They're medically important. And our work with HSV-1 then led us to explore other members of the herpes virus subfamily because right. they sort of do different things to translational control and infect itself. Right. And it led us to explore um, a lot of different things. So... I'd like you to look back on your body of work and pick out a key experiment and tell us how that emerged and what it meant for the field. Okay. Uh, for the field, that's a, that's a tough one. But, but, well, you could but, start by telling us right. what the experiment is. Right. So I told you about this genetic experiment that got us into translational control, and, and that identified a second viral encoded gene, HSV encoded gene, that, that was regulating PKR, this host defense kinase that regulates EIF2 phosphorylation, which is critical hmm. for translation initiation. And in the course of learning about translational control and, and, and working that up, I became very interested in other factors, other translation factors in cells mm -hmm. that were required for translation of viral mRNAs where viruses produced capped and polyadenylated messages that looked like the host. And going back through the literature, um, it became clear that with the exception of adenovirus, nobody really had taken a look at these factors. Um, and and uh, a lot of work on translation in virus-infected cells was sort of slowing down by the time, by the mid-90s, I think. And, and a lot of work on translational regulation was sort of exploding, beginning to explode. And we were learning more and more about translation, but nobody had really gone back to um, what happens to these host factors that regulate translation mm -hmm. in virus-infected cells where viruses make capped and polyadenylated message. Right. So we started by looking um, at, uh, at HSV-1-infected cells. And the other thing that we did is we, we, we wanted to use primary cells as opposed to the standard uh, transformed immortalized HeLa cell or 293 cell because we knew from, from uh, other work in the field that translational control pathways were messed up in these mm -hmm. transformed immortalized cells. So we thought we might miss some things and there might be some things that we would see if we were using primary fibroblasts um, as a model. And you could argue that maybe we should use other kinds of primary cells, those are valid arguments, but that's where we started. And, and we started um, asking some very simple questions about what happens to these factors in herpes simplex virus infected cells. Uh, I was a very talented postdoc in the lab. Derek Walsh at the time really spearheaded that work. Um, 
And even though the virus, we had some very naive ideas about how this would work based upon what we knew about polio and a virus that suppressed host protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. We sort of thought that maybe there was some negative impact on the translation machinery and there was something special going on. Uh, and we found the exact opposite um, in that the virus actually was stimulating the assembly of the cap-dependent translation mm -hmm. machinery. Um, maybe not surprising in light of the fact that polio is a cap-independent mechanism. Um, but there was host shutoff in HSV-infected cells. So we thought there'd be something negative happening to the translation machinery. We found the exact opposite. It turns out that uh, it, it sort of illuminated the, the, the importance of work a number of other people were doing on, on mRNA metabolism and, and tinkering with that in infected cells as a way to trash host cell mRNA to shut off host protein synthesis. But in HSV, we knew that these EIF4 factors, the cap binding protein, EIF4E, um, this large scaffolding protein, 4G, and this RNA helicase, EIF4A, they were, the virus was stimulating the assembly of this complex, stimulating the modification of the cap binding protein by phosphorylation from this other kinase called uh, MNK, which was also part of this assembly. And if you messed around with mink activity, uh, by inhibiting it or with a viral uh, mutation that, that somehow uh, prevented the assembly of this 4F mm -hmm. complex. So we were also able to identify a viral gene genetically that, and biochemically that was involved in stimulating assembly of this complex. Viral replication was impaired. It wasn't mm -hmm. eliminated, mm -hmm. um, but it suggested that this was important for viral replication. And then that led us to look at um, the regulation of these cap dependent translation repressors, the 4E binding proteins, and we found that mTOR was activated by the virus, and that led to a series of experiments that were ongoing uh, to figure out how that happened. Um, so that sort of set the stage that there was something very different going on in HSV-infected cells with how the virus was manipulating this machinery. And, and what it did for us was it made us ask, well, what about other herpes viruses? Mm -hmm. What about viruses that don't shut off protein synthesis? And what about non-herpes viruses like vaccinia virus, um, which may uh, uh, also, which also produce capped polyadenylated message, but mm -hmm. we really had very little idea of what was going on with those factors in vaccinia infected cells. So it sounds like it did have a substantial effect on the field, despite your initial hesitation. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's having more of an effect on the field as more people are coming into mm -hmm. it and starting to study this in, in, with some other powerful uh, techniques, and so I think that's been really fun to see. But there was really a lot of, I mean, we saw a lot of void in, in a gap in the knowledge there. Mm -hmm. uh, and we basically, it was a very conscious decision to sort of go for it and start filling in those gaps. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really been a lot of fun, culminating, I guess, most recently uh, with a paper on, on uh, looking at translational regulation in cytomegalovirus infected cells. So unlike HSV, which is an alpha herpes virus that impairs ongoing host protein synthesis, mm -hmm. host protein synthesis was thought to simply proceed in CMV infected cells. Uh, and certainly that's what you see when you run a one-dimensional SDS polyacrylamide gel. But when you look at the RNAs that are represented on polysomes, even though protein synthesis host mRNAs are being translated, the virus is having a tremendous amount of control on what host mRNAs are engaged on those ribosomes and what are not. And so it's really remodeling the mRNAs that are allowed on the ribosome. And some of those are contributing to viral replication, and some of them have, are important for host defense as well. So that raises a whole, uh, I think it really opens up a really exciting area in terms of uh, um, what's going on in CMV-infected cells and how a virus that doesn't impair ongoing host protein synthesis which is a really effective way of dealing with host defenses, can cope with mm -hmm. um, host mRNAs, uh, exi an existing pool of host mRNAs. And, and what are the determinants that allow a ribosome to know I want to go on this mRNA versus that mRNA? It's something we also don't know very much about. So, so it, do you think that in general the field of translational regulation has been less studied than other aspects of viral replication? Um, I think so. I think, in, in especially when you, I think translational control as a whole has, uh, in many senses, been been not as well studied as transcription. Let's say mm -hmm. in terms of the number of investigators. Right. Uh, but I think 
uh, I think that's really changing. I think post-transcriptional, there's really a tremendous appreciation of the role of post-transcriptional control of gene expression and how it contributes not only to virology, but, but yeah. to biology as a whole and development, especially with the discovery of microRNAs and, and all of yeah. these other neat things that we know about now. Um, Why do you think it's been ignored or less well studied? That's an interesting question. I don't know. I mean, for me, I sort of viewed it as an opportunity. Sure. Um, I mean, you have to sort of pick uh, your poison in terms of where mm. you're going to go. I mean, when I was a graduate student, I also ended up wanting to learn a lot about biochemistry and was very drawn uh, to, to DNA synthesis at the time yeah. because there were some really excellent model systems available for that. And, and, and you know, again, that was also shying away from transcription and, and that yeah. field yeah. sort of took off. I think. The imagination, I mean, transcription is something that certainly interested me from, from when I was an undergraduate, learning about the lac operon and all of these things. It's, I, I don't have a good explanation as to why, but, but I think there's a lot more people studying. Well, that's a good point. The lac operon is something we all learned, right? It was the low-hanging fruit, maybe, and it was done first, and maybe that influenced a lot of our thinking. Right. Could be. And, and there's also, I think... Uh, you know, especially now, I mean, transcriptional control is extremely important, but it, it, it's also, you know, you're, you're programming the cell with a population of, of mRNAs that can then be subject to differential regulation. So depending on what the input is in a given cell type or a different infected cell, mm -hmm. so an infected cell is simply reprogramming the transcriptional output of, of the cell, sure. um, you can have different translational outputs, and, and yeah. it, it creates a very powerful scenario. I guess it would be self-serving if we said viruses have led the way, right? I mean, kind of, um, <laughs> in, in a lot of ways. I mean, when you look at almost all the fundamental discoveries that were made in molecular biology early on, they were made in viral yeah. systems, and yeah. probably because they were very genetically tractable at the time. Uh, I mean, people were, in effect, in, in the bacterial world, people were cloning genes on by isolating prophage or, or def, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. these, or transducing P1 phages. Before there were restriction enzymes, people were doing these sorts of things. So I think it was natural that uh, virology was sort of the inroad into the eukaryotic gene right. expression. And of course, with virus, viruses like the cordis that shut off translation, it's right. such an obvious effect. Right. That it then leads you into mechanisms which are op operative Absolutely. and uninfected, which may be subtle. Right. And, it, and they also lead to an understanding of host cell biology. The, I mean, almost all of the insights that we had initially in the field of translational control were driven by, right. by insights from viral model systems. Right. I mean, even the discovery of the cat, right, and poly tail. Right? Absolutely. So I have a more general question, which is which was stimulated by looking over your body of work. So in many aspects of virus host uh, interaction. We talk about an arms race. The virus evolves to overcome host defenses, and then eventually the host evolves back. Do we see this in translational systems as well? I think you definitely see it. Um, you certainly see it with EIF2 phosphorylation, and, mm -hmm. and there's been some beautiful work looking at the evolution of the of host PKR genes by Harmit Malik. Right. Um, uh, really beautiful work um, uh, looking at, at the faster rate of change in, in those host genes. Um, and, and so that clearly, you know, fits in well with this arms race sort of model. But, but you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're sort of always looking at uh, uh, a fixed equilibrium in the sense that um, if, if one of them wins the arms race, then the other one, you know, the complete victory would annihilate one or the other, right? Right, right. Um, So there seems to be this trend to sort of the stable coexistence. Um, and... Uh, for acute viruses, I mean, I guess they just have to disseminate, but for viruses that might have a, a lifelong relationship with the host, I mean, you could argue there may be some benefit the host is deriving from carrying mm -hmm. that, that virus. Um, but that's a more difficult question, I think, to get at, and, and we really yeah. haven't gotten there yet. But very interesting, right. though. But there, there are also a lot of very interesting host pathways that control translation that can be thought of as restriction, that can restrict viral replication. Maybe mm -hmm. not completely, mm -hmm. but, yeah. you know, for example, we know from some stuff that we've done looking at a, a herpes simplex virus kinase that um, doesn't have any primary sequence homology to AKT, but seems to phosphorylate a lot of AKT substrates, including the tuberous sclerosis complex, which is very important in mTOR regulation. Uh, and, and in effect, it's inactivating uh, tuberous sclerosis complex activity, which is stimulating 
mTORC1 to inactivate these four EBP repressors. Uh, and if you prevent that from happening, uh, in effect, viral replication becomes restricted. So you can think of, mm. you can think of this as a, a pathway that the virus has to inactivate to make the translation machinery more accessible mm -hmm. for viral right, replication. Right. Um, is that going to be an arms race? I don't know. We don't, have, we don't have evidence on the other side. But some of these processes are so conserved, maybe, maybe they're not designed to be as mm -hmm. malleable evolutionarily as something like yeah, PKR. Sure, sure. But. So look back over the time you've been working in science. How has, how has technology changed and how have you used this in your work? I think a lot of the, the capacity of, of arrays and certainly RNA-seq has really uh, opened up the possibilities of really getting a tremendous overview of, of translational regulation and what mRNAs and, and how a population of mRNAs on ribosomes is, is remodeled in response to infection in the case of host cell shutoff or in the case of CMV without host cell shutoff. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of these techniques... Um, uh, like the ribosome profiling technique um, developed from Jonathan Weissman's lab uh, at UCSF are, are extremely powerful in, in giving you positions of ribosomes. Um, uh, Noam stern Ginasar, uh, who now has her own lab in Israel, has done beautiful work use, showing how you can use this as a tool to annotate a viral genome and find new open reading frames that were completely missed before. Um, uh, I think that really has the capacity to, to really advance our understanding of coding capacity um, and also can be used to understand how um, host mRNA and viral mRNA translation is changing in infected mm -hmm. cells and can, can help us understand what it is about the selectivity of an, a ribosome for a certain kind of message, mm -hmm. you know, in right. terms of right. a sequence element, a structural element in that message or you know, a modification to the ribosome or the ribosomal proteins, are there specialized ribosomes? And it's raising really, I think, a lot of very exciting questions. Mm. Yep. And, and maybe yep. viruses can be used as model systems to sort of lead the way and, and, and teach uh, the host cell people um, something <laughs> once again. Maybe viruses <laughs> right? have even more tricks up their sleeves. Of course, I'm, I'm sure. There's no doubt. So, of everything you've done in science, what is the one thing that you think has contributed the most to the field? Uh, to the field, experimentally, or, or could be in any area? way. In any way. I mean, I don't know if it's to the field. I, I would like to think, at least for me, it, the most fun, really, in doing this is you know when you're, you know it, you all get hooked on this from the beginning. You want to know the answer to something, and you somehow enjoy answering questions with your hands, working in the lab. But ultimately, when you, when you have your own lab, it becomes more than just you. And, and it kind of has to be that way. Mm -hmm. And it's really gratifying working with trainees, um, pre-docs and post-docs. Pre-docs, so in the sense that people will come in and they may not um, be as confident or know their way around. But, but I mean, I think it's really important to get them to become, I mean, I want my trainees to become my peers as quickly as possible so we can argue about science and mm. think about science and make the, discuss the experiments and make them the best experiments and the most critical experiments. And it's really important that that happen. Uh, and so the idea is somebody will come in, there might be some training wheels that get strapped on for a while, but then you have to take the training wheels off. And then you also mm. have to know when to let go and let them soar. And, yep. and, and, and yep. when that happens, and when you see somebody after, the, the, toward the you know, the second half of their time as a PhD student or as a postdoc, you know, you see them really just explode. It's, it's really, and, and nobody really knows that except you, you know, and it's a, it's a very, maybe it's sort of a selfish feeling, but it's a very proud feeling. And, and, and I've had that happen a number of times. And to me, that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So that's a good segue to my next question, which is a lot of readers of this book will be students and some of them interested in a career in virology or in science in general, what kind of advice would you have for them? Um, I think in general, I mean, it's general advice, I guess, about being interested in, in science uh, in general. Um, I think it's really important to have a good mentor, um, to pick a mentor carefully. And, and it's not completely obvious how to do that. Um, and, and I think a lot of people only realize it 
when it's too late. <laughs> um, but it, it's important. It's not just the mentor alone. It's, it's also you as the person who's going to be the student, the trainee, or the fellow. It, it, it's a, there are two components to this relationship, and you have to bring something to the table, too. You have to bring the desire to do something really important. You have to really be curious, and you have to bring something to the table that, that, that you want to do something really significant and important. And you need a mentor who will allow you to do that, who will guide you and help you do things that fit the bill. And it's probably not just going to be, you know, the mentor is going to say, oh, here's this one thing, and this is it, and you do this, and you're set. You know, you, there's going to be a, a struggling process involved, and you're going to have to try a lot of different things, and you want to be with a mentor who will allow you to do that and who will allow you to find that and, and really allow you to really take off once you find that. And, and, and so um, I think that's really important. Uh, and you have to want to succeed and you have to find a mentor who's going to allow you to go through this process and kind of protect you um, from outside influences or, or pressures. Um, so you can be free to ask those kinds of questions. And I know it sounds really simple, but I don't think it's an easy thing to find. Okay, now that we've discussed your day job, maybe we could talk about your career as a drummer. As a drummer, right. Uh, so um, I, I have been playing drums. I've been banging on things I've been told ever <laughs> since I was a kid. I think I, I had this toy drum that my parents got me. Uh, and uh, I started taking formal drum lessons when I was seven. Uh, and I played in a variety of bands. Um, and I, actually, that was the driving, the driving, I probably shouldn't say this, but I, but I will. The driving force in selecting the University of Rochester for me was, was the fact that the Eastman School of Music was there. And they have a very strong music program. I also was aware that they were a very strong liberal arts school and there was, it was just good in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. and, and so I was involved also in taking a lot of percussion classes there when I was there. I was also very interested in music, very involved in the college radio station. Um, and and uh, that really all changed once I got bitten by the science bug when I was there. Um, and then um, I guess when I was in graduate school, I had some friends that we would hang out and jam regularly on the weekends. That was a great release from, uh, from the lab. And, 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 um, and then it, my playing sort of, I really didn't play for a very long time until uh, the group of scientists at these herpes virus meetings started uh, finding some instruments in back rooms and venues where we were and we started playing together. And uh, it became very informal. And then it turned into some formal gigs at various meetings, some of the herpes virus workshops, and then there was the, the famous ASV gig. And so it's an ever-changing array of people. There's some really excellent musicians that, that uh, are also outstanding scientists, and it's been a lot of fun. Well, they're not exclusive, right? No, no. Um, and, and, and it's been really fun to, to hang out at meetings and, and to do that, at, uh, to play at meetings. It's just been a lot of fun. What's the name of that band? The band has a most unfortunate name uh, called the Herpetic Lesion. <laughs> Legion is a pun on lesion, but, but uh, it, it's, it's the kind of band that only a virologist would love. Let's just leave it at that. I saw you perform at right. ASV a couple of years ago. You were very good. And um, I have a video of it, which is on YouTube, and people can easily find That's by correct. searching for Herpetic Legion. That's correct. You can... Uh, Vincent was there to document this for all of posterity. <laughs> and so we have a core, a core lineup, although, although the ASV lineup was quite interesting because we had RNA virologists and DNA virologists playing. And so that was really important. It sort of was unifying the field, I guess, <laughs> and, uh, um, as opposed to the herpes workshop where we typically have DNA virologists. Although we have this one computer science person from uh, Cornell in Ithaca uh, who's really terrific, uh, and he sometimes drives halfway across the country with a car full of equipment, and amplification equipment and PA equipment to make these gigs hmm. possible. So it's really quite an interesting mix of people, but it's, it's been a lot of fun. Great. Ian, are you a member of the American Society for Microbiology? Yes. Yes, I am an ASM member. Is, this, is there any value for a virologist to be a member of that society? Uh, absolutely. I mean, First and foremost are the journals. I mean, mm -hmm. the ASM journals are, are, are 
stalwarts of, of, of microbiology. I mean, you have Journal of Virology, which is a fantastic journal, but then uh, it's a lot of great material for the, about the eukaryotic hosts and, and other journals that are ASM journals, including MCB. Uh, uh, and there's also the bacteriology journals. I mean, bacteria also infect eukaryotic cells. And mm -hmm. um, so besides the journals, um, I think uh, the meetings, um, there's a lot to say for what bacteria are doing inside eukaryotic host cells, at least the ones that do invade um, eukaryotic cells, in terms of manipulating translation. And, and, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a lot of interesting effects of infection biology on translation inside a cell, irrespective of whether it's a bacteria inside a cell influencing ongoing host translation or a virus. And uh, Nahum Sonnenberg and I wrote a review um, dealing with, with how other uh, uh, pathogens like bacteria or parasites might impact uh, ongoing translation in the eukaryotic host cell. So it's not just confined to viral mm -hmm. biology. So um, you can hear about uh, those sort of things at the ASM meeting, and it's a great venue to bring virology and, and bacteriology together. So when is the next Herpetic Legion album going to be issued? Well, it's, it's, we're hung up in all these legal proceedings, you know. <laughs> I mean, with our manager, it's kind of like, you know, what Bruce Springsteen was going through when, when uh, after Born to Run was released until the next album came out. So we have to resolve all these legal issues, and, and, and who knows what the technology will be when, when we're ready to release that. It'll probably be on Google Glass or something, so... All right. Well, looking forward to it. Ian, thank you for chatting with me today. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me, Vincent. It's been my pleasure.